Alexandra has done a lot of uh, uh, amazing work in many areas. Uh, she is uh, very well known for her work on uh, uh, co-algebra and, uh, and many related topics. But today she will uh, give us a, a lecture on uh, cats and uh, she will uh, introduce it uh, right away. I think it's uh, related also in part to the lecture uh, she gave uh, last year, um, not uh, completely probably, uh, but uh, they are available uh, on uh, last year uh, website. Thanks, Alexander. Okay, thanks, Marco, for the introduction. So let me see if I can share my screen. Um, so, okay, can you see my iPad screen? I actually cannot see what I'm sharing anymore, uh, which is not helpful. Um, so- Yes, we can see your uh, iPad. That's, that's great. And if I write, you can see it as well. Yeah. Yes. Okay, that's good. Uh, so before I start, I should say that there's um, William Smith is, I think, the contact point for my lecture and is somewhere in the audience and he has the uh, power of unmuting and muting. And so if you have questions, um, just pop them on the chat and we'll, uh, we'll read them and he will interrupt me if he wants. If he doesn't want, he can wait. Um, William. I have, Billy, I have uh, some white slides uh, as I go through. Those will be good moments to interrupt me, but you can just unmute yourself and interrupt me any moment if there's a question, really. Um, so that's, there's that. Um, cool. So as Marco said, I gave a course two years ago, um, back when we were still traveling and we were in Eugene. And I talked about um, automata and co-induction and so what I want to do this year, so that course was an introductory course. Um, this course is a little bit more, uh, one could say, advanced, but I will still keep it at a quite basic level. But what I would like to do this year is basically connect some of that material. And I will, I will this is completely self-contained, so I will introduce this, the things I need. But I want to connect it more to verification. And basically what I want to do is tell you um, about cleaning algebra, the algebra of regular expressions, and applications of cleaning algebra. So here's the plan for the um, lectures. So today we're gonna to be doing uh, basic material on cleaning algebra. Uh, we're gonna be defining what a cleaning algebra is. We're gonna be looking at something called Jozowski derivatives. We're gonna be looking at Antimerov derivatives and we're gonna be looking at um, equivalence via automata. I do see that my iPad has changed the formatting of my slides. So hopefully it's just this first, uh, first slide that has a problem. We'll see as we go. Um, and then I will be moving on to um, slightly more advanced topics. So in the second lecture, I want to show you a technique called co-induction up to, which um, is relatively recent and it is a more efficient way of checking equivalence in, in automata and, and also in expressions. And then in the third lecture, um, I'll talk about equivalence via the axioms and I'll, I'll actually show you how to prove completeness of linear algebra axioms. And then in the last lecture will be an overview lecture of extensions of linear algebra um, with different structures and how you can use that in, in program verification. So um, my lectures are, you know, I have lots of material on this thing. So if there is something you, you'd rather hear more about as we move on to the lecture. So after today's lecture, if there's a topic you guys are more interested in, and you ping me on Slack, I can actually change the content as we go along. It's not really um, extremely strict that I do exactly what I what I plan. So please do, uh, you know, do ask for content on demand. I'm happy to adapt my slides. I'm I'm doing a lot on the uh, whiteboard uh, between quotes. Uh, so I'm I'm happy to do different content if um, if you guys want that. Um, okay, so let's start uh, with what I had planned for today and do interrupt me anytime. So before I go on to the technical um, side of things, I would like to give a little bit of context on why uh, this work on automata and regular expressions and linear algebra is actually interesting from a program verification perspective. So you, you might have simple um, while programs like the ones that, are, uh, that I put here on this um, slide and they look slightly different. Uh, one looks a bit smaller than the other. So you might, you know, you might for some reason prefer 
um, this program on, on the right here. Um, and so you could imagine that um, the program on the left is a slightly less efficient uh, version than the program on the right. And there's this program transformation that gives you the program on the right. And then the question is, does this program, is this program transformation correct? So can I safely replace one program by the other um, and still have the same behavior? And so this, this notion of equivalence between programs has been around for many, many decades. There's a lot of work back in the 70s and the, in the 80s on something called program schematology. There's then work on compiler optimizations and, and so on that basically look at this question. Given a, a basic imperative program, if I do some transformation on it that potentially makes it more efficient, how do I prove that this, two, this transformation is sound, that these two programs are um, equivalent? And using equivalence in, in verification uh, appears in other context, contexts, not only um, in sort of program schematology or compiler optimization. Um, the last few years, I've seen a lot of work on, on using linear algebra and using this sort of reasoning in networks. Um, so my colleague Nate Foster at Cornell leads a big project on a language called NetCat, okay. which is basically built on top of Clini algebra and uh, in which they use equivalence of regular expressions to actually look at properties of networks, for instance, reachability. So for instance, this uh, little network I put here on the, on the slide, um, if you look at the red path on the network that goes from I1 to, to E1, um, the nodes, I1, C, D, E1, and so on, they are running some program. And then you might want to know if uh, packets make it from node I1 to node E1. And really, to check that property is actually the same as um, computing whether a certain equivalence of this language called netcat, which looks very much like regular expressions, is true. And so, in fact, um, an expression like the one I wrote here, where P is a program denoting um, the topology of this network and, and what is happening in the nodes. So I didn't give you details about P. Um, but basically, you can write a regular expression equivalence question. And the answer to that question is equivalent to actually checking reachability um, in this little network. And so this is why equivalence is, um, is important. So equivalence of, of expressions and equivalence of programs. And so one could say that you know, this whole thing gives you a, um, a research program, if you like, on verification via program equivalence. And um, what I want to do in, in these lectures is showing you different techniques to check equivalence of different languages. And we're going to start with the most basic language, which is regular expressions. And then we're going to move on um, to something a little bit more complex in the last lecture. Um, the other thing to say, I mean, I've been talking about programs and um, expressions without actually saying what equivalence really means. Um, so what I have in mind and what usually people have in mind is that it, an imperative program has a set of traces. So if you look, let's say, at the control flow of the program or even at the data flow, you can extract from that um, a set of traces that tells you what changes in, say, in the contents of the variables. Or in the case of the, the networking example, again, you can build uh, traces from looking at the, how the packets change through the network. So you can say you have a packet entering through node um, I1 in this network, and this packet gets transformed as it goes through the network and gets changed. And if you record the states of this packet as you go along, that really gives you a notion of trace for this network program. And so there are different notions of traces. And depending on you know, the language you're looking at and what programs you're trying to analyze, the traces might look less or more complicated. Um, Clini algebra and regular expressions give you a good abstraction of a potential trace language. And, and that's really what I want to show you. So these languages of traces that I, I'm mentioning um, have been studied for many, many years. I mean, they go back um, to, the, to the 50s. And what we're going to focus, at least in this first, um, first couple of lectures, we're going to focus on a class of languages of traces called regular. So um, let's just 
look at the picture on the right, which is uh, something called the Chomsky hierarchy. Um, probably most of you have seen this, but basically if I have um, an alphabet, which um, I through the slides, I will either call A or Sigma, then I can build over this alphabet, I can build words. So let's say um, my alphabet is, oops, my alphabet is um, two letters, A, B, then, you know, I can build words over this alphabet, I can take the empty word, or I can take the word with just one letter, or I can take words with two letters and so on. And so A star is just basically the set of finite traces that you can build from the letters in your alphabet. And the letters in your alphabet, so the alphabet is finite, but these letters can represent very complex things. So you could imagine that, that A could represent the content of some variable when the content is zero, and B represents the content of the same variable when the variable is one. So you can really play around with these alphabets um, to, to make them suitable for program analysis. And so a language of traces is basically just a set of words. And if you just take an arbitrary set of words from A star, that language is not necessarily um, very tractable. Um, so you can take an infinite, I mean, you can take an infinite subset of words, even though the words are finite, you can take an infinite set um, of words. And then uh, the properties of this set very much depends on, on whether this set belongs in one of these um, classes in the Chomsky hierarchy. So the class that we're going to be looking at through these lectures is the class I, I marked here in pink is a class called regular. And then um, the next class in the in the hierarchy is a class called context free. So for instance, the if you look at languages over um, the alphabet AB, and you want to denote all words that have the same number of A's and the same number of B's, um, that set, so if I look at um, let me actually write this as a set. So if I look at this set, A to the N, B to the N, that language is actually a, an example of a context-free um, language that um, is not regular, okay? So there will be different, so different um, classes, but in this, for the purposes of my lecture, I'm mostly gonna look at regular. Okay. Um, so let's talk about Kleene algebra a little bit. So Kleene algebra was introduced by um, Stephen Kleene back in um, early 50s. This is a picture of, of him. Um, and basically the idea, I mean, if you look at the original paper, which is a really, um, really interesting article, uh, he introduces regular expressions as a language to capture patterns and um, the way he, he thinks of them, I mean, he's at that time, he's talking already about neural nets and, and things like this, and he's trying to capture patterns in these nets. And uh, the class of nets he looks at is, is pretty close to um, automata and actually what he then, so he is, uh, his famous result called, that we refer um, to as cleanest theorem today is basically showing that the class of languages that regular expressions denote is exactly the same class of languages that deterministic finite automata accept. And I'm gonna go through, through that in a moment and I'm actually gonna do the proof, um, the proof of that theorem to show you how, how that works. Um, but here, here's just a couple of examples. Again, I'm gonna go through uh, careful semantics of, this, of these examples, but just so that you get a flavor of the things we're looking at. Um, so for instance, this first example here is a regular, a regular expression over alphabet 0, 1, so actually 0, 1 are the letters, and um, it's denoting the multiples of 3 in binary. And that's the same language as um, this automaton here accepts, and again, the, the meaning of acceptance might not be clear to you right now, um, but that will become clear in a couple of slides. Um, you can also write a simpler one would be this one. So if I have alphabet A, B, then the um, regular expression a plus b star is actually an expression denoting everything I can write from letters a, b, so all the strings over a, b. And that's accepted by a very simple one state 
automaton. Okay. So this is just the first flavor. Um, we're not going to look at the um, actual um, syntax and semantics. So what is a regular expression? So a regular expression is um, built out of three basic components. So it is built out of um, letters from an alphabet. So we start with a finite alphabet A, as I said. So A, just to recall, A is a finite alphabet. Oops. And so I take the letters as the basic uh, building blocks of my expressions. And then I have two special symbols. Um, I have a symbol zero and a symbol one. The symbol zero is basically meant to denote the no action. So really, no, sorry, no uh, word in the language. So really it's there to denote um, the empty set. Whereas the symbol one is saying, I have something, but that something does not talk about letters. And so that's going to denote the empty word. Um, and that again, I'll show the semantics in a moment. And then we have three um, operations to use in the building blocks. We have a plus, which basically tells me that I take two expressions and I want to take the union of their traces. We have a um, just a position, or sometimes I write it as a semicolon, which is sequential composition. So you first do an action from R1, and then you continue with actions from R2. And then we have the star, which is the iteration, and basically tells me you can do as much as you want using R. So you can do something from R, and then you can do again something from R, and again something from R, and so on. And you can do this a finite number of times. Okay, so we'll see some examples in a moment. So how do these expressions, which are syntax, so that's important to note that this thing here is syntax. How do these expressions actually denote traces? So what sets of traces do these expressions denote? And so here's um, the language semantics or the trace semantics of regular expressions. So as I said, the constant zero is denoting the empty set. So it's saying nothing has happened in this program. Whereas the constant one is denoting that something has happened, it was just not visible. So it's the empty word. The um, letter A as a program denotes the trace built from the letter A. The plus basically recursively computes the language of R1 and R2, and then takes the union. And the concatenation takes the concatenation. OK, what, what is concatenation of languages here? So U composed with V is really just taking any word in U and any word in V and plugging them together. So basically I have a set of traces, I have another set of traces, and I just pick one from each set and put them together. And I do this for all of them. So the, the concatenation is, is, can be as large as the Cartesian product of, of the two sets. And then the iteration here, um, so that's a different um, thing. So let's see how to define that. So U star is defined as follows. It's the union for all n of the n-fold concatenation of, um, of u. And um, u0 is just the language with the empty word. Okay, so you basically, as I said, the meaning of R star is that you can do anything from R as many times as you want. So basically, um, you can take the traces in u and you can repeat them as many times as you want. And that's what this um, expression basically here gives you, okay? So here's a first exercise uh, to see if we, if we got a bit of a flavor for, for regular expressions. Um, so the first exercise is uh, asking what languages do these expressions actually denote or describe? Um, there's two expressions there. And then the second exercise is if you can actually build a regular expression 
um, denoting the language of all words that contain um, the pattern ABA at least once. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to wait a couple of minutes and let, uh, let people try. Um, and we're going to do just one of these exercises. And then, you know, if you want to try them later on and ask on Slack for solutions or something, we, we can do that. Um, but this will give me one minute to drink some water while people are thinking about, about the solution. And you can, if anyone wants to answer, I guess you can raise your hand or write on chat and Billy will, Billy will tell me. In the meantime, by the way, there is a question from uh, Prasant as well. Okay. Uh, he's asking if the ideas of DFAs and Kalini algebras are equivalent, how would you choose which model to use for the purpose of analysis? Aha, uh -huh. that's a good, that's a good question. Um, right, so the equivalence is indeed powerful because it gives you two alternatives, but then the question is which one is better? So the answer is somewhat in the middle. So for certain, um, let me backtrack a little bit. Most of the time, the answer is automata is better because automata are, are very um, easy to implement, if you like. Their operational structure is very amenable for algorithms. And what I will show tomorrow in the lecture will actually capitalize on that. So it will show you how very efficiently you can check for equivalence using automata. Uh, however, the, if you look at the complexity of checking equivalence for both expressions and automata, in the worst case scenario, these are actually the same. Um, so it is sort of, you know, in theory, you could choose either. Uh, in practice, a lot of the equivalence algorithms um, behave better for, for automata. Having said that, expressions are much closer to the intuition. So if you have a proof of equivalence using automata, you might lose some insight on why the equivalence is true. And the expressions and the proof using uh, equalities on these expressions, which is something I will explore later, that's much closer to uh, human intuition on how to do program transformation. So expressions also have a place to actually explain certain equivalences. So there, there's a place for, for both in some ways. Billy, did anyone solve one of these questions? No one said anything yet. Oh, there we go. I have one. You have one. OK, let's take the one that is there. OK, so uh, Joe Bond has proposed, uh, do, I, do I read it out? Uh, for the regular expression at the bottom uh, contains ABA at least once. He's okay. proposed uh, A plus B, you know, star, ABA, A plus B, star. So let me write this down so that I, so it's, so ABA, is that correct? Yes, that. Okay. Anyone disagrees with this? How about everyone who agrees raises their hand? That would be a good way to test things. How many raise hands do we have? Uh, Oh, wow, lots of raised hands. Okay, cool. Cool, cool. Okay, I guess, uh, I guess that, uh, that solves it by uh, majority. Um, very good. This is one option indeed for, um, for this expression. And later on, um, it will be interesting to see uh, how to actually draw an automaton for this same language um, and how how that uh, compares with um, the regular expression in terms of compactness. Um, okay, Billy, are there more questions? Uh, there are a couple more proposed solutions if you're interested in those. <laughs> uh, for this one or for the other ones? Uh, for the other ones. For the other ones, okay, let's, why not? Let's do that. Uh, so, Oh, wait. Uh, so Vincent has proposed that uh, the first one, A plus B, A plus B, A plus B star, is just capital A star. So A being the yes. alphabet. Is what? Sorry. 
just uh, A star, A capital A being the alphabet. That is just that. Mm -hmm. Is that what you said? Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Who disagrees with this one? Oh, sorry. Ah, I did something. I did something here uh, and I deleted this. Let me write this again. Is there anyone disagreeing with this? A good amount. Mm -hmm. A good amount, yeah. A good Seems amount, like okay. Um, let, you know, can, does anyone wanna explain why this is not true? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. We've had uh, pr someone's proposed uh, an another answer in the chat since, and I think, uh, yeah, Vincent has accepted it as well. Uh, a plus B, A plus B, and then A star afterwards. Right. And how do we describe that in, in words? I mean, that is the formal description, mm -hmm. but what does the, I mean, what are these languages? These uh, are languages with at least two letters, right? Mm -hmm. The length of the words in, um, so basically what I have is, if you want as a you know, set description, is uh, words in, in A star indeed, such that the length of U is greater or equal to two. Okay, this is assuming, sorry, I should have said this. This is assuming that A is AB. Okay, so then this, this expression is basically telling me, do whatever you want, as long as you pick at least words of length, of, of length at least two. Okie dokie. Okay, so let's move, let's move on to the next thing. If there are no more questions, Billy, am I allowed to continue? Yep. Cool. Okay, so we've seen expressions. We've seen um, semantics of expressions. And now um, we're gonna look at automata. So we're gonna look in particular at something called deterministic finite automata. So what is finite? Well, a deterministic automaton is a pair, which is a set S of states. So it's a set S of states, and it has um, two functions. One, one function telling me if a state is final or not, and one function basically given us a uh, state S and the letter A in the alphabet, it gives me the next state. Typically in textbooks, you will see um, deterministic automata also having an initial state. Um, for my lectures, I'm ignoring the initial state. And the word finite um, in, in this definition really refers to the set of states. So the set of states is assumed to be finite. So here on the side, you see uh, an example with two states. So this example here on the side, S is S1, S2. And then the function O is a classifier. So it's a characteristic function um, that tells me which states are final. And I've denoted in this um, picture by a double circle, the states that are final. So the function O will assign a one to S2 and a zero to um, S1. And then the transition function here will be, um, will be like this. So the T of S1 for letter B is S1. And the T of um, S1 for letter A is S2 and so on, okay? So this is an example of such, of such structure. And now how do we um, actually accept um, words with this or how do we denote words? Let me just delete here so that you can see, you can see my slide. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna first um, take the transition function and we're gonna take an inductive extension of the transition function so that you can actually read words from a state. So basically this function is saying that 
if I read the empty word from a state S, I stay in the same state. If I read a word AW, what I do, I first read the letter A from that state S, and my function T from my automaton gives me another state. And then I read the rest of the word, so W, using my inductive extension. Okay. So for instance, uh, in this automaton that I have depicted here, if I look at T star of S1 of AA, where do I end up? Well, I first, I start in S1, I read an A with T, I end up in S2. So I'm just gonna work it out here so that you see. So I do T star of S2, and then I still have to read an A. And then I read another A and I end up in T star of S1 of the empty word, which is S1. So this function is really depicting reading the word back and you know through the automaton. So I start in S1, I read A, and then another A, and I'm back in S1. If I had read A and then a B, then I would be in S2. Okay, so the inductive extension is really talking about reading the word through the automaton. And I very often in these slides, and this is important notation, I'm gonna write S underscore W, the word W, to actually denote this function so that I don't have to write the whole function. And now the language accepted by a state in the automaton is really all the words such that when I read the word through the automaton, I land in a final state. So final states are the ones that say you can accept. And so this is what this definition basically tells me. A word is in the language of that state. If when I read the word from that state, I end up in a, in a state such that the O is one. So for instance, this example here, what type of words can I read from S1? Okay, from S1, I can do a lot of Bs. Then if I do an A, I accept. If I go back with the second A, I'm back in S1, which is rejecting, so I cannot accept, but I can do loads of Bs. And then I can go back with another A, and then I can do loads of Bs. So what can I do? What does S1 do? S1 basically accepts anything that counts when it counts the A's, counts it for odd number of A's. So this, this state here accepts all words over AB with an odd number of A's. And dually, S2 accepts all words that have an even number of A's, okay? Okay, so this is, these are deterministic uh, finite automata. And here's a quick exercise. Uh, well, quick. Uh, so in this exercise, I, um, I, there's a bunch of automata and I actually marked, I don't know if you can see this, but there's an incoming arrow here on some states and that's pointing that this is the state I care about. So this is the initial state, and this is the state I'm asking the question about. So the question is, what languages do these automata accept? And you will note that the first one on this um, exercise list is the one I just gave you the, the answer for. Um, let's uh, look at uh, a different one. Um, so let me think which one, how about, okay, the. The question for now, the other ones will remain as homework, but how about this last one? What does this last one do? What words can I accept with the very last one? Billy, any takers? Otherwise I'll make Marco answer. This is my backup. If no one answers, I just get Marco to answer. Uh, we have one proposal in the chat so far. Okay, we can wait another 10 seconds or something. Sorry. 
So can you give me an answer, Billy? Uh, one that's got some, some approval from people is the number of Bs. So for the bottom one, the number of Bs in the words is not one modulo three. Okay. So I actually have the answer on the slide, so I'll let you see it. Um, so the, the language of, of the state indeed is um, the words. So, so wait, what did you say now? Sorry, now, I now need to map what you said to the answer I wrote down. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so uh, yeah. they're saying the number of Bs in the word, modulo three, is not one. Indeed. So it's either, it's either uh, zero or two. And that's exactly what uh, what is written in the solution, in the solution here. Um, and you will see that um, first one, as I said, is the one that was on the slide before. So the odd number of A's. Then the, the second one is related to the exercise that we did on, on regular expressions with a smaller subword. But basically, it's all words that um, contain the subword B A. And then we have um, the third one is the language of words such that every A is always followed by a B, okay? So you will see, I mean, one, uh, the reason why this third example is here, you will see that if after an A, I have another A, I, I land in this state Q2, which is sometimes called a sync state because it has a loop to itself and it's not, it's rejecting. So anything that goes in there, it's done, so no, you cannot accept anything here, okay? Whereas here, you have the opposite thing. So if I do an A and then a B, I'm in an accepting state, I can do as many Bs as I want, but if I do another A, then definitely I need to do a B to come back to a, an accepting state, okay? So this is an exercise. Um, very cool that people got the answer to the last one. And now here is where I make the connection with, um, my class of last year, um, and I will try to, to do a, a sort of five minute uh, comment on um, co-algebras and, and some more abstract concepts. Um, I would like to just take a quick poll on, have people um, seen category theory? If yes, um, put your hand up. So there have been some uh, talks that have, you know, had a good deal to do with category theory so far. So I guess uh, the question could be uh, if people are comfortable with category theory, you know? Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. I didn't, I didn't have a chance to attend the other talks. So that's good to know. Um, okay. So that's good. So that means I can sort of assume at least a few things. And if people, um, you know, uh, struggle with, with any word I use, please do ask in the chat um, and I will, uh, I will just explain. So basically, what, what do I want to do in these five minutes? I want to show you that the reason that um, automata accept languages is not really um, by chance. The reason why automata accept languages is actually can be explained um, in a very fundamental way. So in particular, you will see here on the left, um, an automaton. And this automaton is an, an arrow in the category of sets for the functor two times identity to the A. And on the right here, I have two to the A star, which is the set of languages. And two to the A star, sorry. Yeah, Alex, are you drawing right now? Because for some reason I can't see it. Uh, yeah, no, I, I put the next slide. That was my mistake, which was an empty slide where I intended to continue drawing. Um, sorry. Ah, my slides are, okay. So this is an automaton. These are languages. Hmm. I think the drawing's still frozen for some reason. On a, oh really? Yeah, like like and, uh, and the other so frozen. 
and you are also frozen now. Yeah, I guess I, I guess this might be an internet issue. Uh, but my voice is okay. Somehow. Mm hmm. Let me see if I can do something about that. Uh, Zoom is not reacting at all at the moment. I guess Alexander is trying to reconnect. Yep, I think it shouldn't take long. Okay, can you hear me? Yep, we can. The whole yep. thing crashed. Um, let me see if I can share my screen. Okay. Okay, let's see if you can see me writing. Do um, you see that? Yep, yeah. Okay. And now, maybe I can even put my camera on if this is um, okay. Yep. Is there, am I not frozen? Nope. Okay, not frozen. cool. That's cool. Very good. All right. So uh, I think this is the world telling us we shouldn't talk about co-algebra. It's like uh, we get to the co-algebra part, it crashes. But I'm still going to try. If it crashes again, I promise I'll skip these slides and just move on to the to the next part. Um, so basically, the only thing I wanted to show you is that um, the fact that automata accept languages and that regular expressions denote languages is an instance of, a, of an abstract phenomenon. So in particular, um, there is this, this diagram that I wrote here in the slide that says, for any object of this shape, there exists a unique homomorphism L, so there exists a, an arrow L that commutes with this object on the right. And this object on the right is special because it's basically the object where you can map every, you know, you can take any S here and there's always a unique mapping. So there's a unique language. And what is this object on the right? So it's a set of languages as the state space. And then it's saying that the set of languages are itself an automaton. And that structure, that automaton structure is given by something called the Brzozowski derivatives. They are called like that because they go back to um, Janos Brzozowski back in the 60s. And basically it says, given a language, um, you know, let's say uh, U in two to the A star, you can always look at that language and tell me whether it's final or not by checking if the empty word is in the language. So if the empty word is in you, you give a one, you give a zero otherwise. And then the, the transition structure on the language, actually I'm gonna, I'm gonna write it um, using my previous notations. If I have you, and I want to look at the transition on A, 
that gives me all the words you in, sorry, all the words you such that a you is in you. So basically the transition is just deleting the letter A. And so these two things here um, are the semantic Drozovsky derivatives and they provide the set of languages with an automaton structure. And that automaton, so the automaton in which the state space is languages and the transition structure is given by Drozovsky derivatives is an infinite automaton. So the state space is infinite. So it's not a finite automaton, but it is a special automaton because any other automaton can be mapped into it. And that map L, and that's why I called it L in this slide, happens to be the language map. So given an automaton on the left, so given an automaton here, if I compute what this L is giving me by using the fact that this diagram commutes, that gives me exactly for a state S all the words that that state is supposed to accept. And um, that is, as I said, an instance of a, of a larger, of a more abstract picture. So given a functor F uh, for many, for a large class of functors, there exists something called the final coalgebra of F, which is a state space, which we I denote by omega here, that also happens to have an F structure. And this F structure here, so let's call it alpha, uh, is such that there is a unique mapping from any X into omega of F. And that unique map um, is sometimes denoted like this because it really, the, the final coalgebra, so this structure here, when it exists, gives me the space of behaviors. And in the case of um, F being two times identity to the A, there's an abstract result that says omega F has to be two to the A star and alpha is Brozowski derivatives. And more than that, alpha, you can always show that for any omega f that exists, this alpha here is an isomorphism. And that's important uh, for certain properties. But so this is sort of saying, if I have um, a well-behaved functor f, then I always know abstractly what its semantics should be. And in the case of automata, that semantics is languages. So it's not by pure chance that traces or languages of traces is the semantics that you provide in automata. And we will see that regular expressions also come with a similar result. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna do a lot of these remarks that might sound completely, um, uh, you know, a, a bit off topic, but for those who are more familiar with uh, category theory and functors, um, this might be helpful to understand some of the material. For those who are not, you can basically tune out while I'm doing this intermezzos, these remarks, and then we'll come back to more concrete uh, material. So, um, Billy, are there questions at this point? There are a couple of questions about the, the previous slide. Yeah, did you want to take them or okay. move on because it's an intermezzo? Yeah, let's, let's take them because I'm moving on to a different thing now. Oops. Okay, uh, so start with um, uh, in the previous slide, there was uh, a morphism that you wrote as L to the power A somewhere. Okay. And uh, uh, just asking what morphism that refers to. So that I wrote like this, I'm yeah. guessing. Uh, so if I have a function from X to Y, I can always write a function from, so the function f to the a is a function from x to the a to y to the a. And what is this function? It takes, um, let's call phi, the objects there, and it takes an a, and it's supposed to give me a y back. So what can it give me? Well, I can apply phi to a, and I get a little x and then I apply F to that. So in fact, if you look closely, 
you will see that this is just function composition. Are you reading other questions, Billy, or was this it? Uh, there was only one other one, I think. So uh, on the on the like uh, commutative diagram that you drew uh, earlier, there was the there was an object uh, two times two to the power a star. So uh, and they're just asking what that object refers to and why it corresponds to a language. So the, the bottom right of two the time. the bottom right of the commutative diagram that you showed uh, previously of uh, the square. So this thing here. Yeah, I think uh, there was a there's another yeah that. Right. So this thing here, just the the um, the domain. This is basically. So let me do this in a different color here. So this thing here is functions from a star to two, which is the same thing as a subset of a star. Uh -oh. And that's why it like corresponds to a language. It looks like Zoom might be having a problem. Your video is still moving though. I'll t I stop video for a second to see if- Okay. Yeah, some, somehow the screen suddenly showed up. <laughs> Maybe it just can't do both at once. Uh, yeah, might be struggling. Um, so did you did you hear what I said about uh, the characteristic function? So a star to two is sort of a characteristic function of a language L. So this thing here is basically the characteristic function that corresponds on one to one to subsets of a star. Is that what the question was? Did I understand correctly the question or? Yeah, I think they're just asking what this, this object is and how it connects to languages. Yeah, so this object, yeah, I should have said that. I write, I threw out my slides and, and uh, during these lectures, I, I very much switch between the set definition of languages, which is subsets of words and the equivalent representation using uh, characteristic functions. So functions from A star to two. Okay, no more questions? Not for now. Okay, so let's move on. Um, so what we've seen so far, I mean, we've seen regular uh, expressions. We've seen the semantics of regular expressions as languages. And we've seen automata and how auto automata accept uh, languages. Now, Kleene algebra is more than just regular expressions and their semantics. Kleene algebra is actually regular expressions and a set of equations that those expressions satisfy. So a Kleene algebra formally is um, the set of expressions that we saw before modulo the following equations. So the plus, the plus symbol is, satisfies associativity, commutativity, idempotency, and has zero as an identity. And if you think carefully about this for a second, you will see, let's look at this last one. You will see that, you know, the semantics of this is basically that the language of E union the empty set is the language of E. So it makes sense that this equation holds, but remember this thing here is syntax. The fact that they hold has to be proved. So you really have to check that the language of, um, of these expressions is the same. Uh, sequential composition satisfies um, three three laws, well, really uh, five if you count um, the dual laws. So it, it is associative, it is not commutative. So you cannot do, um, you cannot swap programs when you're sequentially composing them. And the one is the identity, 
and the zero is basically um, absorb. It's the absorbent element. So if you have E and you compose it with zero, then that gives you zero. And if you think intuitively is saying, okay, if I've done something with E and then I cannot do anything, then I'm stuck. So I cannot do anything. And then um, sequential composition and plus interact in the following way. Um, they distribute both on the left and on the right. And I see now that there's a type on my slide that's supposed to be a one. Um, and then the iterations satisfies the following laws. So E star is a fixed point. So it says, that's what these two laws say. They say E star, what can I do with E star? I can do nothing, so that's the one, or I can do E followed by E star. And I can do this on both in both ways. So I can either do it on the left or on the right. Now, this just says that E star is a fixed point. But in fact, E star is more than that. And so there's another axiom of Kleene algebra that says that E star is a least fixed point. And in order to do that, um, we need to introduce an order between expressions. And this order is by definition, something called the natural order that says E smaller than F, if when I, union E with F, I actually get F back. And so with, with this definition of order, then you can write down um, an axiom that tells me that, well, it's not, it's not really an axiom, but it's an implication that tells me that E star is a least fixed point. So in particular, um, I can write that if I have that E is equivalent to F plus um, let me see how to write that. Let me write X and then G. Then, so if E is smaller than that, then E is smaller than um, G star and then F. And you can also write so this is the left one, and you can also write the right one, which basically is, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. I made a mistake. Ah. My slides just ended my work, so I will have to do it again. Okay, I'll have to write that axiom again. Uh, so basically that axiom is saying the following. So it is saying that if X is below F plus X G, and remember that the below is just the natural order then X is below G star F. And dually, you can write, if here I have G X, then here I will have G star F, okay? And so basically, Kleene algebra is the set of regular expressions that satisfy all um, all these axioms. Let me see if I can start my video so that you can see. Um, and this is a definition. So this is syntax. It's saying I have these the syntactic expressions and they satisfy these axioms. And now the set of languages that I've shown you, in particular the set of regular languages, are an example of a Kleene algebra because um, every regular language will satisfy with the operations we mentioned before, will satisfy these equations. Okay, so let's look, um, so th there's an exercise here, but given the time, I'm gonna skip this. Um, you can look at this later. You can prove some cool equivalences using just the axioms. So I'll leave this as homework um, and the slides will be available so you can look them up later. But here's some examples of, of Kleene algebras. 
So regular languages, which we've seen, where plus is union and um, the, the sequential composition is um, pointwise concatenation and the star is iteration. Then we also have um, binary relations are an example of a clean algebra uh, where the plus is union again and then the sequential composition is relational composition and iteration is reflexive transitive closure of a relation. Uh, then maybe uh, something not so obvious, if you have a clean algebra and you build square matrices over this clean algebra, then you actually get another clean algebra. And there the plus and the sequential composition are just lifted using the usual plus and times of matrices. And the star is built inductively uh, using the star of a two by two matrix. So the, if you have a two by two matrix, the, the star of a two by two matrix is defined in the following way. And actually I will explain later why it is defined in this way. I, I'm not gonna explain now, but there's a definition. And then starting from a two by two matrix, you can actually compute the star of larger square matrices. Now, the reason why these uh, examples are, are interesting is that actually binary relations play a key role in some uh, verification um, tasks. And so you can give as a semantics of um, imperative programs, you can give a relational semantics, and then you can use uh, the fact that relations form a clean algebra to reason about this. And the square matrices over a clean algebra will play a role later on for automata, which you will see hopefully still today, uh, otherwise tomorrow. So what I wanted to do today was showing you a proof of um, this famous result called cleanness theorem. So this theorem goes back to um, 1952, and it says the following. Uh, if L is a subset of A star, so if L is a language, then the following are equivalent. L is regular, and L is accepted by a deterministic finite automaton. Again, my slides seem to have um, cut a word. And the proof of this theorem, um, this is not the proof in the original paper, but sort of a proof of this theorem is as follows. To show that if a language is regular, you get um, a deterministic finite automaton, you can actually use a syntactic analog of Jozowski derivatives, and I will show this next. And the other way around, if you start from an automaton and you want to build a regular expression, so my definition of a language being regular is that it is denoted by a regular expression, you can use different uh, methods, but one method is called state elimination, and it's actually related with those two by two matrices that um, I mentioned before. So let's um, go through the proof of one to two. And so we're going to use this, this gadget called the Przozowski derivative. Um, so this is the syntax of regular expressions we saw before. And what is a Brzozowski derivative? Well, I want to give regular expressions the structure of an automaton. So what do I want? So if I, if I talk about this um, set as being the regular expressions over an alphabet A, what I want is to build an O, let's say, of R and a T of R that give this set an automaton structure. So that gives me outputs and it also gives me an expression given an input A. So how does this work? What do, what do I want in the end of the day? I want that these Brzozowski derivatives are doing what the semantics on the other hand is doing. So here's the definition and we're gonna go through it. So for the expression zero, which is denotes the empty set, the, um, the derivative just says it's a non-final state. For um, the expression one, which denotes the empty word, the derivative says it is a final state because it has the empty word. If I have a letter, I cannot accept the empty word because I still need to do an A transition, so that's zero. And then for the composed expressions, the star is the easy one because the star can do zero steps, so it should accept. The plus accepts if either R1 or R2 accept. So the plus is translated to an or, and the, the sequential composition is translated to an and. And here this or and and 
is referring to looking at the set 0, 1 as a lattice like this, in which 0 or 1 is 1. OK? When it comes to the transition structure, I want to capture this idea that an A derivative is basically removing an, a letter A from the expression. And so here, here's how it works. From 0 and 1, I cannot remove anything because there's no letters. So that can only give me the empty set. And that gives me the expression 0. If I have a letter A and I'm trying to remove a letter A prime, then it's one or the other. So either my letters are different, and then I return the empty set, or they are the same, and then I'm left with the empty word. Um, if I have a plus, then I need to, if I want to remove a letter A, I need to remove it from both R1 and R2. And then I can combine them again with the plus. The concatenation is really the most interesting one of these um, derivatives. How do I remove a letter A from an expression that is composed of R1 followed by R2? Well, one of two things happens. Either I'm lucky enough and I can remove the A from R1. And that's what this first thing here says. It says you can remove the letter from R1 and then you continue with R2. But that's only good enough if R1 doesn't let me skip. So if R1 happens to have a skip action, so a one action, then I also have to account for the fact that I might, I might have to remove the A from R2. So this is what, um, what this uh, definition says. Basically, if R1 lets you skip, then you need to account for the fact that the A might come out of R2. If R1 doesn't let you skip, then just remove it from R1. And for the star, it just basically says, remove it from R, and then you can do anything that R star lets you do. OK, so what we did here is basically a definition that gives you um, an automaton structure to regular expressions. And now the question is, are we done for our proof of, um, of Clinis theorem for one implication? So is it true that now that I have these derivatives, I have shown that every expression corresponds to a finite automaton? And if you take the expression a star star and you start computing derivatives, uh, you will see that um, these derivatives, so you will see here that these derivatives keep getting bigger and bigger. So the sum keeps getting bigger and bigger. And this process won't stop, which basically is telling me that the automaton associated with A star star seems to look like A and then something and then A and then something, oops. So in fact, this automaton um, doesn't seem to be finite. So that's not good because Clinis theorem says that every expression should correspond to a finite automaton. So what, you know, what went wrong and what can I do uh, to help here? So if you look at the expressions here that I'm finding, what will you note? You will note that I have a bunch of things here, which are zeros. And you will note that all the rest that is left is basically one A star, which is, uh, by the way, just really A star, and then A star star, which is what I already had here in the first step. So in fact, um, in fact, the automaton that I'm trying to build is this automaton here, the one state automaton. And I almost got it, except that the expressions I was producing have all this garbage of 
zeros and repeated expressions in a sum. So how do I get, you know, how do I get away with without this? Well, what you need to do is basically add a little bit of cleaning algebra axioms to the process. And this is where um, the next theorem comes and I'll, I'll need to delete some things for us to be able to see it. Uh, there's a theorem which is due to Drozdowski that says, if R is a regular expression, then the set of syntactic Drozdowski derivatives is finite if when you take them, you actually take them modulo associativity, commutativity, and eigenpotency. And that's enough. So that's a sufficient condition. Um, you can go further and eliminate things like zeros, uh, but you don't have to. So if you take them modulo ACI, then you have a finite automaton. And that finishes the proof of one direction of Clinis theorem. And um, here I would do another intermezzo on, on final co-algebra. Uh, but I believe, and Billy, maybe you can help me here because I'm, a, I'm slightly confused. Is my lecture supposed to stop at 6.20 or 6.30? I think, I think you're supposed to go until 6.30 or you, you can rather. Okay. Um, okay, I'll, I'll go for a little bit and then I'll try to stop a bit early because I think you need a break before the next lecture and I'm not quite sure what time they start. So I'll go for five minutes at least and then, um, and then I'll stop. Mm -hmm. um, so the only thing I was gonna say here is that again, giving this uh, structure to uh, regular expressions is actually, um, is actually the reason. So having these Brozovsky derivatives on regular expressions actually um, gives rise to an abstract view on regular expressions that justifies why the denotation of regular expressions are languages. So the fact that I can have this automaton structure here gives me a unique map into the set of languages that if you compute the actual definition of L, you will see it's exact, exactly the denotation of the regular expression. Okay, I wanted to briefly show that there are alternative proofs for this um, for this one implies two. So in particular, there's a very famous construction called Thompson construction um, that takes an expression and associates it with an automaton in the following way. So for instance, if I have R plus S, I assume I already have an automaton for R. I assume I already have an automaton for S. And then what I do, I add a, an initial state and I link this automaton to the initial states of my other automata with so-called epsilon transitions. And uh, you can do, you know, sequential composition, you have an automaton for R, you have an automaton for S, and then you connect all the final states of R into the initial state of S and you delete the fact that these are final because they are not final anymore. You have to continue with S. And so this construction here, this Thompson construction is very efficient and that's why it's very popular, but it produces automata that, are, um, that have these epsilon transitions and because of these epsilon transitions and, and some other things, they produce automata that can have multiple, from one state can have multiple transitions with the same letter. So these are non-deterministic automata, which I was hoping to talk about today. Um, and so the, the proof has three steps instead of one like we did. So you have the Thomson construction that brings you from expressions to uh, automata with epsilon transitions and non-determinism. And then you do an epsilon elimination procedure and you do a subset construction, which then produces a DFA. And so you will see in books and notes, I also have some notes online where I show this alternative proof. Um, okay, and now I wanted to show the, the opposite direction. So from two to one. And that's where I'll, I'll stop today. I'll show this and then, um, and then I'll stop. Uh, so from two to one, I wanna go from a DFA 
to a regular expression that denotes the same language. So a DFA accepting L, a regular expression denoting L. And one technique is called um, state elimination. And it goes back to that two state matrix that we had um, before. So how does it work? It works as follows. If I have a two state automaton or a one state automaton, I know exactly how to write a regular expression, or I mean, I, I just do it by hand. So for instance, for one state, what does this accept? It accepts U star. And if I would have, um, you know, a state that is not, um, that is not accepting, then this would accept the empty state. Um, and then for two states, I have two options. I only depict one here. Uh, if I have, a two-state automaton where Q0 is non-accepting and Q1 is accepting, then the language of this automaton is denoted by this regular expression. So it's U star, which is basically denoting this loop. Then I do an X. And then after I do an X, I basically can do V star, or I can go back in all kinds of ways to Q1. And that's what this says. V and then y u x, and then I can do this multiple times. Okay, and this expression here, which basically denotes um, the language of this two two state automaton, can be used to to then, um, given any size of the FA, construct a regular expression. So if I have a three state DFA, and the so I, I take state, just for the sake of the argument, I, I take state P to be initial, and I have some, some state Q in the middle, and I want to get rid of Q so that I have a two-state automaton. Then the way I get rid of it is basically by replacing all the labels that go into Q and out of Q by an expression denoting the path. So if I have, if Q has an incoming label X, and a loop and an outgoing label Y, then I can delete it and replace it by a transition that actually is labeled by a regular expression X V star Y. And basically this proof from two to one using state elimination does this in uh, multiple steps. So for instance, if I have this four state automaton and I want to delete Q1, so this is, this is the state I'm trying to delete, what can I do? you will see that Q1 has an incoming A, then has this loop B, and then an outgoing A. So how do I delete it? I simply replace the transition there by A, B star A. And now I have three states. And so then in the next step, we could delete Q3 and then get a two-state automaton and then when you have a two-state automaton, you know how to compute the expression because I just showed you in the previous slide. And that expression denotes the same language. And um, there's an alternative proof to this, um, to this implication, which comes from solving a system of equations. And uh, I think I'm gonna stop here um, and I'm gonna start here next, next time um, because it will take me a while to, to go through that. Um, so let me, let me just recall what I did today and I will um, give you an adjusted uh, version of tomorrow's lecture. So we went through um, the definition of regular expressions and their language semantics, the definition of deterministic finite automata and their language semantics. Uh, we've uh, looked at the proof of correspondence of these two things, Kleene's theorem. And I showed you uh, basically one, you know, one way of proving each implication. Uh, I want to show you an alternative proof to the second uh, part. So going from automata to expressions, because this involves matrices over Kleene algebras. And so that's, that's sort of an interesting technique. And then tomorrow I will start by showing you that and then following up with some material on non-deterministic automata and showing you how non-deterministic automata are more compact to represent languages and why they are interesting computationally. 
And then we're going to look at the equivalence problem between um, automata, both deterministic and non-deterministic, and how you can actually um, check for equivalence of, of automata in an efficient way. So I'll stop here. Um, I know we don't have much time for questions. I'm happy to take questions on Slack as well. So I created a channel called KA for clean algebra. So join that, um, that channel, ask questions. I'll be online um, now for a, for a couple of hours so I can, I can answer questions now or, or offline later, later well, the on. Chat, um, the chat has pointed out that the next lecture is going to begin at 640 if they're correct. So it's we're not immediately. Okay, so that. maybe um, we can take like an up to six thirty. I, I, you know, I'm a huge fan of you guys taking breaks between lectures. So I really do not want to eat into your break too much. But let's say we take four minutes of live questions if there are questions now. Otherwise, I'll respond on Slack. There were a couple in the chat that I should probably relay okay. about the axioms for cleaning algebras. Um, so, okay. uh, for instance, one one simple one is uh, under under the natural ordering. There are some questions about the semi lattice structure. So. Uh, I think they were asking, does is addition a join operation, and is there a meet, and is it a lattice? Oh, um, so <laughs> yes. Uh, so the way I presented it, the plus there is is a is a join semi lattice. Okay, uh, there is a whole other uh, jungle of clean algebras with, with MITs. Um, and that's a very interesting uh, question, whether you can extend um, clean algebra with, with MITs and with, with other operations. Uh, but for this lecture, I'm just considering the plus in a joint semi-lattice. OK, uh, there was a question just generally for a reference uh, covering the proofs that you've been going over in more detail, in particular the uh, syntactic Brasowski derivatives and states elimination. Um, I have some lecture notes. Uh, I mean, the original, these proofs are, are in some of the original papers. Um, my PhD thesis contains a, an introductory chapter on these things, and it, it does contain a lot of these, um, a lot of these proofs. In particular, the Brzozowski derivative ones is in the chapter three of my uh, PhD thesis, which you can find on my webpage. Um, that might be a good um, source. Uh, there's another one from a while ago about uh, essentially whether it might make sense to have E star star equals E star as an axiom for cleaning algebras. Like that? Uh, e, E double star equals E star. E, E. E, E so star star. Like that? Uh, Sorry. Okay. Let's just let's do it. it on... Okay, say again. E just just E star star equals E star. Yeah. Um. So okay, so that's one thing I, I haven't said. This is valid. So this is sound. It is not necessary. So in this following sense, and this is what this is the subject of lecture three. The axioms I've shown you for clean algebra are actually um, sufficient to derive all possible equalities between regular languages. So in particular, this one can be derived using the axioms I've shown you. I believe it was one of the exercises I, I left uh, in one of the slides. So this can be derived using the axioms I showed. I'm happy to, um, to show the derivation if people cannot, cannot do it um, in tomorrow's lecture. Okay, and uh, one final one from the chat, I think. Uh, the question is, is it correct to say that the set of regular expressions over an alphabet sigma is the free Clini algebra generated by sigma? Yes, uh, so, sorry, uh, modulo all the axioms. Yes, and the set of regular languages is the free Clini algebra. Okay, that's all the ones in the chat for now. Okay, thanks a lot, Billy, for uh, helping out. And, um, you know, apologies for the technical difficulties. I hope um, people uh, could follow. And as I said, I will be online on Slack, so feel free to, to ping me. And I'm looking forward to um, tomorrow and enjoy the rest of the lectures today. Nice to see everyone.